Hi, I'm Ian Frazier, lead designer on Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. And I'm Joe Quadera, lead combat designer. Today we're very excited to show you something that's previously only been shown behind closed doors, our E3 demo of Reckoning. We're here at the Baltimore office, Big Huge Games, and we're going to show you kind of an assortment of different things from the game. Now, one of the tricky things about a game like Reckoning is that it's, it's huge. This is a massive open world RPG that features in tech section combat fused to a backbone of hardcore RPG systems. That's a lot of different stuff going on, a lot of different places. So it's really hard to show it all in a quick demo. So before we jump into the live portion of the demo, we're first going to show you a video reel that features some of the different systems and locations and just bits and bobs within the game to hopefully give you a little bit better sense of scope. Now my usual disclaimer up front, everything you're about to see is pre-alpha software, so we still have months of debugging and polishing left ahead of us. Nonetheless, we're really excited about where we're at and we want to show it to you, so let's roll the clip. Reckoning begins with you gasping for air as you crawl your way out of a pile of corpses. You soon learn that you've died and you're the first person to be successfully resurrected by this arcane machine called the Well of Souls. Now somehow your mysterious death and resurrection have torn you free from the tapestry of fate, granting you the unique ability to forge your own destiny and change the fates of those around you. Now, like most RPGs, one of the first things you'll do is customize your character. You can choose your gender and pick from four different races, and then you can customize your appearance. You can pick from a preset look, or you can choose from dozens of different options of face shapes and hairstyles, skin tones, tattoos, piercings, you name it, to get exactly the look that you want for your character. Reckoning features a truly massive open world to explore, with five different geographic regions, each with its own unique look and feel, in addition to a number of villages and cities, each full of characters with their own daily lives, routines, and schedules. Everything has its own style and look, and we have over 120 handcrafted dungeons, no two alike. In addition to the main quest that begins with your rebirth, Reckoning features a number of different faction lines. In fact, six different factions you can join, each with their own extensive stories to pursue and to enjoy. We also have literally hundreds of different side quests, each of which, each of which can be performed myriad different ways, ranging from the straightforward to the downright criminal. You there! Halt! The combat in Reckoning is something else we're very proud of. It's fast, fluid, and intense. It's very responsive, it's very dynamic, you have the sense of weight and heft to everything you do. It's intense action combat, but all built on a solid foundation of crunchy advancement systems and player choice. We also have a very robust loot system, featuring countless affixed items that can be generated. That's where you get your flaming helm of the wombat as well as literally hundreds of handcrafted unique items with their own lore, art, and of course, stats. Now let's say you don't like the loot that's dropping. That's okay, you can make your own. We have three different crafting systems in Reckoning. First, alchemy, which lets you make potions using reagents you'll harvest throughout the world. Next, blacksmithing, my personal favorite, which lets you salvage components from weapons and armor that you don't want, and then use those components to craft new equipment that you do want. Meanwhile, Sagecraft lets you fuse together shards of magic crystal to make gems. Gems can then be socketed into your weapons and armor to enchant them. Now, there are more skills in Reckoning than just the crafting systems. In fact, we have nine different non-combat skills. One of them, Detect Hidden, lets you find secret doors, treasures, and ambushes scattered throughout the world of Amalur. Meanwhile, Dispelling lets you turn off magical traps called wards without them blowing up in your face or giving you a curse. Pretty handy skill to have. Meanwhile, Persuasion unlocks a variety of dialogue options throughout the game, either giving you alternate paths through quests or giving you better rewards at the end of those quests. Meanwhile, Stealth lets you do that, which is awesome. A stealth also opens up a variety of different crime activities you can perform in the game, from pickpocketing to trespassing in places where you don't belong. Reckoning has over 60 abilities to choose from every time you level up, spread across the might, finesse, and sorcery trees. Which abilities you choose to invest in defines your moment-to-moment -moment combat experience. These abilities range from passive benefits to unlockable weapon attacks like this one, to flesh-melting spells that let you rain fire from the sky. Now which abilities you invest in matters, not just in terms of the abilities themselves obviously, but also in terms of what destinies you'll unlock. Destinies are a sort of form of dynamic character class in Reckoning. 
See, in most RPGs, you start off, and before you really know what you're doing, you have to say, I'm going to be a warrior, and I hope you chose well, because you've got dozens of hours of that left ahead of you. In Reckoning, we wanted to get around that problem, and the Destiny system is how we do that. So, you start the game off, and you are both fictionally and systemically a blank slate, with no destiny at all. As you get through the early parts of the game, you get to try out being a warrior, being a rogue, being a mage, and throwing a fireball, see what that feels like. And after you've gotten some sense of that, you'll level up for the first time and start investing points in those three trees. Based on where you invest the points, you're going to unlock destinies. And a destiny is more or less a class that you can equip and take upon yourself. And over the course of the game, as you continually make decisions of, over the course of leveling up and invest points in different things, you unlock more and more destinies. So you can constantly be changing your course in the build and in design of your character over the course of the entire play experience. Now we're going to hop into the live portion of our demo. The part we're jumping into here specifically is a, an area of the story involving the Warsworn, one of those six joinable factions that I mentioned. Now the Warsworn are a simple group of mercenaries, warriors for hire. But you learn early on in the story that they weren't always simple mercenaries. In fact, they were founded as a quasi-religious order, a group of warriors dedicated to hunting down vile creatures of pure chaos called Niskaru. Now the Niskaru had been gone for hundreds of years and believed to be extinct, but you also learn early on that that's not the case. They're back and they're back in force. And a lot of the Warsworn faction revolves around finding out what's going on with those Niskaru and getting rid of them. So we're just going to hop real quick through character creation here. Just choose some presets. Alright, so here we've hopped into Brigands Hall, a cave where we find these bandits we've been following. Um, and we're starting to get bits of hints that there's more than banditry going on here, that the Niskaru have actually taken root in this cave. But we don't really know any more than that, so we're going to investigate. See the bodies up ahead? Thieves, most likely. If it was these poor fools that brought the Niskaru, they got what they deserve. Doesn't seem likely, though. All right, so before we do too much more with the Niskaru, we're first going to loot, because that's what we do. Let's see what this guy's got. Sky Blossom. All right, some alchemy action happening. Okay. Guess he was picking flowers in the loot. You know, like you do when you're a bandit. And over here, we're going to see another little bit of our loot system that we're, we're especially fond of, and it's the collectible armor sets. So as you can see, we're wearing this, this you know, matching set of armor. It's actually the armor of Helios, the sun god. Pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> By grabbing this helmet here, we're actually completing the set. Each piece we get from that set, we can just compare that, yeah. As we get more and more pieces from a set, we get a larger and larger bonus. So with the helmet, we finally get the maximum bonus and you know, the whole shebang. Also, we look cooler. Now, one of the neat things about our loot system, and this is a minor note, but we like to mention it, You'll notice we didn't go into our inventory screen there. We actually can loot items directly, or even equip items directly from the loot UI. Um, I'm, I'm lying because Joe <laughs> loves the inventory screen. No, you, you actually can uh, compare and equip and even junk items directly from the loot UI. Up ahead, I see some cultists. What's up with these guys? What's this? Bloody mages. Not Balin's testament either. Regardless, they must be the ones behind these Niskaru. That means they've got war sworn blood on their hands. Now, one of the interesting things about the dialogue system in Reckoning, we realize that some players really don't care about dialogue. They really don't want to talk to the characters. They want to get back to the action and start lopping off heads. That's okay. Because of that, we take our quest critical lines, like behind the Niskaru here, we highlight them in blue and we throw them to the top of the list. So it's immediately obvious and easy how to just progress and get back at a dialogue if that's not what you're into. If, however, you do want to delve deeper into the characters and the lore of the world, we always have a variety of info topics below where you can do just that. And if you dig into those, you'll unlock more and more and you can find out more about the world around you. The shortest path to a Niskaru is with chaos magic. Powerful chaos magic. And to keep it from turning around and mauling you, more powerful magic still. Now, just past uh, our buddy Ost here, we're going to see a number of cultists 
who are holding Niskaru within magical barriers in an attempt to tame them. Generally not the best idea. Now, our buddy Ost would very much like us to kill them, and we're happy to oblige. Right then. Die! Die! Alright, so as you've hopefully seen, even in this little small snippet rather of combat, the combat and reckoning is very fast, it's very dynamic, it has the look and feel of an action game. Everything is very, very kinetic as you fly throughout the space, you see these pauses in animation where Joe's momentarily slowed down in the air, all these various things in animation that really sell the weight and power of combat, sort of the, the drama of the whole thing. But in the end of the day, we don't want to give the wrong impression, the game is an RPG, not an action game. So we're not asking you to memorize button combos. You know, if, if you watch Joe's hand on the controller, he's not hitting X, X, Y, Y, B to pull something off. Mostly X. Mostly X. There was some Y. Actually, most, mostly X. You didn't really use that? I didn't use, didn't okay. use daggers at all. <laughs> ah, very sad. <laughs> that would be it, yeah. I'll do it next time. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's easy to perform, and it's very, well, it's an RPG. It's all about what equipment you've purchased, what abilities you've unlocked, what destiny you've chosen to equip. Everything about your moment-to-moment -moment combat is driven by your RPG decisions, and then the awesomeness of combat is where the action game impulse comes in. So now, watch out. So if you've played an RPG before, you know that there's more dangers in a dungeon than just enemies. Sometimes you'll find traps. like that one. So fortunately, we have ways to deal with this. As I mentioned earlier, there's a number of non-combat skills in Reckoning. One of those, Detect Hidden, will help you deal with things like traps. If you look at the mini-map in the top right, you'll see little orange dots. That's because we've invested enough in Detect Hidden to see where those traps are to help us avoid them. Now with more points in Detect Hidden, which is how many we have here, we can also disarm those traps, and not only that, we can actually salvage them for the components used to build them. Now this is handy because this feeds back into the different crafting systems in the game. Like here, for instance, this is a fire trap. If we'd stepped on this thing, it would have blown up and set us on fire. Now, conveniently, we're able to disarm it using Detect Hidden and get this cl cloudy fire shard from it, we could then use that in the Sagecraft system to make a fire gem and socket that into our sword to make a flaming sword. Oh, Lots of oh, fire. We could actually make a, uh, I think, a pristine gem with that. Uh oh, uh oh. I failed with that one. Sadness. That's okay, I don't want any fire gems or poison gems. Anymore. So here we're going to see another of the player skills stealth. Now, stealth is very handy in a city environment because it lets you do a bunch of different crimes like pickpocketing and stealing and generally getting in places where you don't belong. In a combat environment like this, in a dungeon, it'll let us sneak up on this guard and take him out unnoticed. So as I mentioned, there are a variety of crimes. One of those is pickpocketing. And although, frankly, we're going to kill this guy anyway, first we're going to take his stuff. Pickpocket. Another shard, not bad, and a lockpick. 
And now he's good. Oh, he found you. Uh oh. 95% chance of success, I get the 5%. Pretty much, yeah. Alright, All right, next time we max out your stealth skill. Now, if you see that purple glow in the corner there, that actually means that there is a warded chest nearby, which is something you'll tend to find around a lot of spellcasters, like in this cave. Uh, a ward is sort of a magical booby trap that casters will put on their belongings. Now, fortunately, with the dispelling skill, we have a pretty good shot of getting through that ward without it blowing up in our face or cursing us. As you invest more in the skill, it makes this minigame easier. And don't worry, if you hate minigames, you don't have to do it. There's also a percentage chance-based model you can use, which also scales based on your skill. bad actually. About First time around. That was good. I don't really want fine silk shoes. Do you want fine silk shoes? I'll take them. Okay. Uh, I take everything. Just, just take it, sell it all? Mm -hmm. Like, look, I'm going to loot this guy. If, actually, if we weren't doing a demo, I would be looting every possible thing in this room. Yeah, that's the tricky thing with demoing this game. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Can you get that and can you dodge before it blows you up? Yes, yeah, so we have a trap that's going off here in the corner just as I'm looting this guy, this body next to it. And I'm going to try and dodge out of the way as soon as I take this up. It's going to be mid-animation. Oh, yep, there it is. Oh. <sighs> so, having been blown up by a trap here, um, you may have noticed over the course of some of the fights thus far that occasionally a thin purplish-blue line will zip from an enemy to the player character. Those are threads of fate. Because of your unique free agent relationship to fate and destiny, you're able to earn small amounts of fate energy every time you defeat an enemy or perform well in combat. Once you have enough fate energy, you can harness it to go into a special mode called Reckoning. In Reckoning mode, time slows down, you speed up, you do ridiculous amounts of damage, you become highly durable. You're an all-purpose badass for as long as you have fate energy left to burn. And when you defeat enemies in that mode, they don't just die. They begin to unravel, their fate's coming apart. And you can do this to multiple different enemies as long as you have Reckoning mode still going. Before Reckoning Mode's over, you want to run up to one of these guys and Fate Shift him. It's a special sort of fatality move that will destroy not only that enemy, but every enemy you've set to unraveling in the area and give you a huge XP bonus for the whole lot of them. Now, the fight up ahead is just one big enemy and not several small enemies, but nonetheless, we'll get to show you a little bit of Reckoning Mode and a Fate Shift kill. By Telogris! By the winds of the Black Depths, come forth, come forth! Nice. So, having fate shifted and defeated the Niskaru here and a variety of cultists within the cave, we now take the artifact in the back, the Heart of Sibin. Now, normally, in the midst of this quest, as again part of the Warstworn faction line, 
we'd have absolutely no idea what this thing is, and we'd want to bring it back to Shield Ring Keep, the nearest Warsworn base, where we'd find out a little bit more about what it is and what it means that we found it here, and that story would kind of continue. But we're about out of time for this demo, so rather than show you more of the Warsworn, we're going to give you a little glimpse of the main quest, specifically part of the main quest featuring the Siege of Melson Shear, a big turning point where the player's unique ability to change the fate of the world around him starts to come into play on a much grander scale than you've seen up to that point. Now, in this demo, you've seen some Niskaru. Joe fought the, the smaller Blood Hunters early on, and then he fought the big Niskaru Tyrant just now. But in this piece of the main quest, you're going to see a much larger, much nastier Niskaru, a creature called Baylor. Hope you've enjoyed this quick look at Reckoning. Once again, coming for the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC in 2012. You said it all. <laughs> You're gonna love the game. <laughs>